Every electronics workbench should have three important safety devices, a variac, an isolation transformer, and a dim bulb current limiter. On my bench, the variac provides isolation, so I don't need the separate unit. I know, I know. Flux, you're wrong. Variacs aren't isolated. Yeah, I've heard it all before, but I assure you this one is. Check out this video I made. I'll leave a link in the description. When your device under test is plugged into these devices, not only will it be safer, but so will you and your test gear. I'm not going to get into the hows and whys of all that in this video, but to see why these things are such a bright idea, see my video on antique radio safety, which talks all about it. There's a link to that video in the description as well. In this video, I'm going to show you how to build this dim bulb current limiter for your bench. But before we begin, a warning. Building and using this current limiter is at your own risk. The one I made is safe for me as I understand how to use it and know that it was constructed correctly. In your case, that last part is going to be up to you. Also note that to build this, you really should know the difference between ground, neutral, and hot. If you're uncertain, well, I've got a video for that too. Link in the description. Okay, so these are the parts you'll need. Everything should be available from your local home improvement center, except for the voltage meter, which you can get on Amazon. Let's run through the shopping list. Two outlet receptacle, 57 cents. Two gang outlet wall plate, $1.85. Switched outlet, $8.97. Oh, and note that my Lowe's only had switched outlets with an indicator lamp. But if you can, get one without the lamp. It's not necessary, and it's not going to glow with the way we'll be using the switch anyway. Moving on, a bulb, $3.34. Make sure your bulb is clear and incandescent. No LEDs or fluorescence. This is the key component, so make sure you get the right one. You have some discretion about how many watts you want, and I'll discuss that later in the video. For this project, I chose 150 watts, and yes, incandescent bulbs over 100 watts for now are still available at local stores. Next, a two-gang electrical box, $7.83. I recommend this Carlon 3 quarter inch FSE box, model number E9802E. Get some 3 quarter inch cable connectors, $1.98. I'm using ProConnects connectors, model number 44741. An appliance cord, $10.98. Get one that's grounded, 16 gauge, and a little longer than you'll need. Socket adapter, $2.38. Voltage meter, $6.59. These are available from Amazon. Search for part number DM55-1. And our grand total, $44.49. Let's build it. First, insert one of the cable connectors into the stub hole in the electrical box. The cable connector will serve to safely hold the power cable in place. If you don't want to use these connectors, that's fine, but you'll need to come up with another way to do this. Note that the connectors have two compressible protrusions. The hole in the electrical box doesn't have slots for these protrusions, so we need to make them. First, mark the inside of the stub hole at two points, directly opposite each other, that start about two millimeters from the edge and are about 10 millimeters wide and four millimeters deep. Next, use a suitably sized Dremel wheel to carefully grind the two slots where you're marked. These only need to be a couple millimeters deep. Now snap the connector in place and feed the cord into the box. Note that once you put the cable into the connector, it's very difficult to remove and this is what you want. If the cord comes out when you tug on it, make sure you fix this before proceeding. Now measure and mark the power cable for the length you want. I went with 3 feet. Now pull the cable through the box until the mark comes to the end of the stub. Cut the cord so you have 4 inches remaining in the box and remove your cable length mark. Now place a 3 inch mark from the end and use an X-Acto to make a lengthwise slice in the cable's insulation from the mark to the end. Be careful not to cut the wires underneath. If you do, discard the length of wire and try it again. Open the insulation along the slice and trim it away. Strip a half inch of insulation from the three wires and twist and tin the strands. To help picture how we'll wire the current limiter, think of it like this. The hot will connect to the switch. If it's switched on, current will flow to the outlet where we plug in the light socket, flow through the filament, and then to the hot side of the outlet where we plug in our device under test. Current will flow through the device, then return to the neutral. Got it? Okay, let's hook it up. First, connect the white neutral wire from the cord to one of the neutral terminals of the two outlet receptacle. Next, remove the breakoff tab from the switched outlet. Now connect the black hot wire from the cord to the hot terminal of the switch. This will be the black screw closest to the switch. For the next step, you'll need black, white, and green jumper wires. Make them from the excess cord you cut off earlier. Now add a white jumper wire between the output of the switch and the outlet's hot terminal. The switch output will be the gold screw closest to the switch, and the outlet's hot terminal will be the black screw closest to the outlet.
Now add a black jumper wire between the switched outlets neutral and the dual outlets hot. The switched outlets neutral will be the silver screw and the dual outlets hot will be either of the gold screws. Now connect the power cable's green wire to the ground terminal of the outlet. This will be the green screw. Now add a green jumper wire between the dual outlet's ground and the switched outlet's ground. Again, these are the green screws. Okay, and now your wiring should look like this. If it doesn't, go back and fix your mistakes. And if you're using different parts than shown here, make sure you're confident you've wired things correctly. There's no guarantee other switches and outlets will be configured the same way. Now that the wiring is done, screw the switched outlet and the dual outlet securely to the box. You can leave the cover plate off for now. Now let's double check our wiring with some continuity tests. Put your multimeter into continuity mode and attach one test lead to the ground terminal of the power cord's plug and make sure you have continuity to the metal housing of the switched outlet and to the dual outlet. Now insert a three wire plug into one of the dual outlets and make sure you have continuity between the power cords ground and the outlet ground. Great, now put either a two or three wire plug into the switched outlet and short the neutral and hot. Now plug another two or three wire plug into one of the dual outlets. Connect one test lead to the neutral prong of the power cord and make sure there's continuity to the neutral side of the dual outlet plug. This should be the case whether the switch is on or off. Now connect one test lead to the hot prong of the power cord and make sure there's continuity to the hot side of the dual outlet plug, but only when the switch is in the on position. Now make sure there's only continuity when the switch is on and the switched outlet is shorted. If your current limiter doesn't pass these tests, don't power it up until it does. If yours is working correctly, you can now install the cover plate. Almost done, looking good. Now remove the socket adapter from its package and plug it into the switched outlet. Make sure the current limiter is unpowered for this step. Now screw the 150 watt bulb into the socket and plug the voltage meter into one of the dual outlets. Plug the current limiter into a standard AC outlet, switch it on and make sure the meter indicates the proper voltage. If so, it's now ready for use. Let's do a demonstration. Switch on the device under test, switch on the current limiter, switch on the variac isolation transformer and slowly increase voltage. Yeah, you can see how helpful the digital display is and why I've added it to our project. It shows exactly how many volts are going into the radio, which because of the current limiting bulb is less than what the Variac is putting out. The bulb filament is barely glowing, indicating there are no shorts and our radio isn't drawing too much current. Now let's try it with a 100 watt bulb. The first thing we notice is that the smaller bulb limits more current and we need to increase the variac voltage even more to get about 115 volts into the radio. You can't really tell but the bulb filament is glowing more now. It's just tough to see it through the frosted glass. That's why clear bulbs work better. Let's now try a 60 watt bulb. Even with the Variac maxed out, the small bulb limits so much current that we can barely get 90 volts into the radio. So you can see there's really no hard and fast rule about what bulb size to use, and it's good to have a few different sizes on hand. If you want a lot of current limiting and a brighter glowing bulb, if there's a problem, a lower wattage bulb is preferable. If you're more confident about the device under test and want less current limiting, go for a higher wattage. Now for some finishing touches. First, let people know this isn't some kind of weird table lamp and put a label on the switched outlet. Only bulbs need apply. Nice job, see you soon. To stay updated, please subscribe to my channel and click the bell to receive notifications when I release new videos. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. I'll see you soon.